Well, good morning, Queensland. Uh, today I can report that we've had 5,665 new cases reported, with 3,186 of those being rapid antigen test uh, reports and 15,151 tests. So it's good to see that our testing numbers have come back up. Uh, that's an indication that we are not seeing the long lines at our testing clinics anymore and we have uh, priority lines for key frontline workers and uh, of course we're making it available to uh, teachers and parents with school aged children who are showing symptoms and needing to get tested. Obviously they can get a PCR test or pick up a, a free rapid antigen test at any of our clinics as well. Uh, as far as our positive uh, children, so our age groups of 5 to 15, our 5 to 11 year olds we've had 923 new cases reported. Uh, that's a decline since yesterday which is great and uh, 745 of our 12 to 15 year olds. So in total 1,668 are uh, down from 1,905 yesterday. Now I do want to report, sadly today I'm reporting 39 deaths, but I do want to um, just outline uh, the reason for that. These are deaths that we're reporting as opposed to deaths that occurred in the last 24 hours. We've always uh, reported uh, how many we have received as far as our records as opposed to the number of people who have passed away. Uh, and we have a number of sources that we get our data from, including weekly data from births, deaths and marriages, and that's why we are seeing an increase today. I'll let the Chief Health Officer just explain in a bit more detail, but some of these deaths go back to the 17th of January, so uh, they're not recent, but I want to say this, it doesn't matter <laughs> that they're not recent. Um, it is still just as devastating reporting these 39 deaths today uh, as it would be if they had occurred in the last 24 hours, uh, and certainly for the families and friends of those 39 individuals. So can I pass on my condolences to all of those families um, because it is uh, sad to be reporting uh, those additional numbers that have occurred over the last few weeks. Uh, in hospitalisation numbers, I'm very pleased to see our numbers are still coming down. Uh, 382 in our public hospitals, 33 uh, in ICU, 16 who are um, not ventilated and 17 who are ventilated and 26 in our private hospitals. Uh, I just want to report, so for public hospitals, that is down from 484 on Monday, down to 382 today, which is fantastic, and down from 30 in the private hospitals down to 26. So uh, we hope that that trend continues, that we see a decline in our hospitalisations, uh, because that shows a decline in people who are becoming seriously unwell with COVID virus and we know that the vaccinations matter. And I'm pleased to report our vaccination rates are at 92.43% first dose and 90.43% second dose for our 16 plus. Our five to 11 year olds are now at 41.5% and our boosters at 62.33%. So over 1.82 million uh, Queenslanders have received their booster. So continue to come out to our testing clinics, community pharmacies or GPs to get your vaccination, whether it's your first, second, or your booster. I'll now hand over to the Chief Health Officer. Now, thank you very much, Minister. So standing here each day and reporting on deaths associated with COVID-19 is without doubt the most difficult part of this job. It is, however, critically important, I believe, that uh, Queenslanders have a full understanding of the picture, picture associated with this pandemic. In the interest of public dis disclosure, we have adopted an approach whereby we report deaths as soon as they are reported to us from a variety of sources, from a variety of direct sources. So this might be emergency departments, public health units, uh, residential aged care facilities. As, so as soon as we are reported, a death is reported where someone has had a positive COVID test around the time of their death, we report those deaths immediately. Every week, in addition to that, we receive a report from the Department of Births, Deaths and Marriages that includes anyone who has died with a recently uh, positive uh, COVID-19 uh, test. And these reports go back a number of weeks. They go back four or five weeks at a time. 
we reconcile what we have already reported against what is reported in the reports from the Department of Births, Deaths and Marriages. And this week uh, we, we received a report where there are 27 additional cases that extend back uh, to mid-January. So that's a total of 39 deaths that we're reporting today. But I, I really must emphasise, this does not mean there has been a peak in deaths. There has not been. In fact, the data clearly shows that the number of deaths from COVID-19 have been falling steadily since the last week of January as we have passed the peak. Okay, that's a critical piece of information. So these, these, these every death, of course, is tragic, but, but these, these cases occurred, most of these cases did occur several weeks ago, and it does not indicate a sudden peak in cases. Um, so of the 39 deaths to report, that includes one person in their 50s, five in their 60s, 10 in their 70s, 12 in their 80s, 10 in their 90s and one person over 100. In terms of the vaccination status I've received, there five have not did, had not received vaccination, two had received a single dose, uh, 16 had received two doses and only two of those for which I have information had received a booster. Uh, 21 of these deaths were uh, occurred in aged care facilities that, and that brings a total of to 229 uh, deaths uh, reported in aged care facilities in Queensland out of a total of 438 deaths uh, since the beginning of the pandemic in Queensland. And uh, again, our thoughts are very much with the families and, and the loss that they have all, all incurred. In terms of uh, COVID care in hospital, our numbers continue to drop dramatically. So uh, we, we have uh, the numbers of uh, inpatients in hospitals have dropped by more than 100 since Monday. Monday, We have 382 people in our public hospitals being treated uh, for COVID-19. It was 404 yesterday, uh, 462 on Tuesday and 484 on Monday. Uh, there's also been a slight uh, uh, decrease in patients uh, in intensive care units down to uh, 33, that's public intensive care units, uh, 17 of whom are ventilated. It was 36 uh, yesterday. In private hospitals, we have 26 patients with COVID-19, including two um, in intensive care. There were 28 yesterday. The numbers uh, in children uh, that we're reporting has also uh, declined somewhat in the last, well, has declined uh, since yesterday. We're reporting 1,668 cases uh, in the last uh, uh, 24 hours, down slightly from 1,905 on Wednesday, but we're keeping a very uh, close eye on that. That includes 923 in the primary school age group, 5 to 11, and 745 in the uh, secondary school age group, uh, set 12 to 17. I'll just yes, go ahead. Just a little bit confused about the deaths. Yes, go ahead. Scenario, yes, so yeah. It's going to be hard to explain. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yep. You're saying this is a lag. Yes, it is a lag number. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, I, I don't know if you want to get into the details, so we get, we get, there are death certificates that are sent to the Department of Birth, Deaths and Marriages, which is the definitive cause of death uh, for an individual, and that will contain the primary cause, secondary cause and other causes. So if, if, if that person had COVID-19, even if that wasn't the primary cause of death, uh, that will appear on the death certificate. Now, it takes some weeks before the death certificates ultimately uh, filter through uh, to us, it's a take, it's a, there's a time, there's a time lag. It has always been our intention to ensure that uh, that we reported on any deaths as soon as they occurred. So we have adopted other approaches to identify deaths. So we directly deal with the emergency departments of every hospital. Uh, we have a system where we deal with the, uh, the management of every hospital, as well as any reports from the public health unit. So we try and get ahead. Of, of the reports from the Department of Birth, Deaths and Marriages. How is that different from yesterday? So we get, so how is it different from yesterday? Well, yeah, so we, we get, the, we get the, the, so the certificates come, the, the reports from the Department of Birth, Deaths and Marriages arrive once a week. So we've got another, uh, so there was a, a lump group of 27. And that figure of 39 today does not include any of the previous figures? No, no, so there, there were 27 that have arrived that, that that uh, came to us from the Department of Births, Deaths and Marriages, plus the 12 that we have identified uh, through our rapid sources. 
So, okay. Sure. Yes, that's that's correct. So we generally, so in a younger person, so generally that is correct. In a younger person, we look closely at those deaths if it is obvious that that person has died from an alternative cause, such as a motor vehicle accident, and that has happened a number of occasions, and they've just happened to have a positive COVID test. I, I will exclude those. But if there, if there is any doubt, they are just included. So if someone has a positive COVID test, unless it is very obvious that there is an alternative cause of death, they will, they will be included in the daily tally. So the total, since... Yeah, yes, the total number is, since the very beginning, was, is 438 is the number I have here, 438. Um, well, I understand that um, uh, the Wagners agreed to release information around the costings yesterday. That's been put out there. I believe that um, John Wagner's spoken this morning about that, and that's 48.8 million. Uh, I believe there's been reports also about it costing 190 million um, over the, the 12 months. I couldn't give you the, the breakdown as operational versus um, the uh, the capital there, but. Can I say, uh, it's pretty clear on the face of it that it's going to cost half of what Pinker Bar is going to cost. Uh, it's been opened far quicker and it also frees up a whole lot of our frontline workers such as police and health workers uh, and paramedics who can get back to doing their jobs uh, you know, in, um, in our hospitals and on the streets. So, you know, it is, uh, I think, uh, a very, very good uh, investment because uh, you know, it should have been done more than 12 months ago. The Commonwealth should have stumped up as they did with Howard Springs and built this with us instead of playing politics. But we are where we are because we got on with it and, and we got it done. Yep, and the Wagners, uh, as I understand, the Wagners agreed yesterday to release um, these costings. Well, that is, that is up to them though. It's commercial and confidence because we have to respect, it's commercial and confidence always respecting the contractual arrangements. If the party that we're contracting with is willing to have that information publicly released, then obviously we are in a position to do that and that's what they did. And we appreciate them willing to do that. I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't part of those conversations. I don't know, I wasn't part of those conversations. Um, well, we've contributed towards the construction of this because we know the benefit of having this facility built, uh, the benefit it has moving away from hotel quarantine, the risk that hotel quarantine um, created, and also the impact it was having on our frontline workers uh, who are having to manage those hotel quarantine. Uh, and we know that this was the best way to manage uh, any cases, including not just positive cases, well, people who are quarantining uh, who may be positive, but th this facility is also available for people who otherwise do not have somewhere that they can be isolating while they're positive. Uh, and we don't want them in our hospitals. We're doing that during 2020 and 2021 because we could, but in the numbers we've got now, you don't want to do that. And I know, you know, that there are um, pressures of people on our health system, pressures people who are positive but otherwise do not need a hospital bed but they do need to isolate somewhere and they don't have anywhere, including holidayers who are at the end of their holiday, find out they're positive, can't extend their hotel accommodation, need somewhere to stay safely. No, this is a, this is a benefit to the people of Queensland. This is a benefit to the people of Queensland um, we have said we don't know what the next variant is when it comes to international arrivals, unvaccinated arrivals. Um, this is a benefit that will um, certainly support the broader community. We partner with private industry on a whole lot of capital investment right across this state. We partner with local government, we partner with the Commonwealth, we partner with NGOs and the private sector to build things. And it's not always ends up uh, government-owned facilities. So, so let's not pretend this is the first time a government is investing in a
capital infrastructure that they ultimately don't end up owning. We do that all the time at all three levels of government. It's, it's not about all negotiations and contractual arrangements, commercial and confidence. It comes down to the negotiations and in individual parties. Um, but in the main, prima facie, all contractual arrangements are commercial in confidence. No, we respect the, uh, the collaboration and partnership with the private sector and we respect commercial in confidence. On this occasion, uh, the Wagners have agreed to release that costings and I'm pleased that they have what and they agreed to do that. Well, let's wait and see if it ever opens and when it does, what resources are involved. I don't think the, the detail of how it's going to be run, what health services are going to be available, all of those sorts of things. I consider Pink and Bars a bit of a hypothetical right now. Um, you can ask the, the Commonwealth about that, but uh, honestly, let's wait and see how good it is, whether it's better than Well Camp, I suspect it won't be, uh, and uh, which is the appropriate facility to use. But I, Well Camp is not going to go to waste. Well, it's better value because it's up and running. If we can't wait till, uh, uh, you know, the Wagner said this morning, it's probably going to be maybe April when that's open. So what's the point of sitting back and waiting and hoping? That's going to clash with the federal election. It's highly possible it just doesn't ever open. So I'm not going to wait for the Commonwealth. We have waited for two years for them to get off their backsides and help us with hotel quarantine and managing isolation, and they've done nothing. I'll have to get those figures for you. I, I believe I, I believe they said that all at the presser yesterday, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I would have to get that figure for you. I don't have that figure today. Uh, so it's the same. We charge the same as what we charged in hotel quarantine. Um, again, we provide exemptions uh, and payment plans for individuals who. Uh, you know, cannot pay that up front. We've changed the rules and the regulations. So in some cases where businesses are bringing in workers, for example, uh, we can invoice the business uh, as opposed to the individuals. And also, and I think the Chief Health Officer has said this previously, in situations where we require them, we put them in there ourselves and require it, then there may be no charge at all. But it's the same as far as what we're charging the public, it's the same as hotel quarantine. Uh, again, that is up to uh, discussions with uh, the Wagners, but um, uh, you know, they have released this, these figures and I welcome it. But it's not. Ask the Commonwealth why it's not. Yeah, there is no point saying to the state government, why didn't you wait for Pink and Bar? Because if we had, we'd be standing here today with no dedicated, specific purpose built facility. We'd still be waiting. We would still be waiting. But none of us, none of us know. Um, none of us know what the future holds. No one knows what the future holds as far as future wave, waves, uh, you know, new variants, all of those sorts of things. So, you know, um, our only regret is that, you know, the Commonwealth didn't partner with us, you know, over 18 months ago to build these facilities. We may have potentially avoided the outbreaks we had in hotel quarantine. Remember, the major outbreaks we had in Australia across New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria and New Zealand came from hotel quarantine arrangements and transporting um, individuals in New South Wales in mid-June. So there was... Yes. Yes. Well, I, I don't know where you get the six weeks from, Lydia. Uh, you know. Sorry? Uh, oh, you're talking about um, whether we move to that in six weeks' time. We will wait and see. We'll wait and see. But Well Camp is not a waste of money. It is an investment that we absolutely uh, 
committed to and it was the right investment to make and it should have been done jointly and it should have been done 18 months ago with the Commonwealth. What the Commonwealth needs to explain, what Scott Morrison needs to explain to um, Queenslanders is why he was willing to partner with the Northern Territory for Howard Springs but not invest in Queensland when it comes to hotel quarantine and a purpose-built facility even though we were asking for over a year for that support. That's what should have happened. So any questions, any criticism around WellCamp should be focused on Scott Morrison and why they did not step up and help Queenslanders. We could have avoided the outbreaks in hotel quarantine. And sadly, you know, we had lockdowns and we had restrictions because of what was happening, because of those transmissions, and it could have been avoided if we had had these purpose-built facilities and the Commonwealth Department with us. Sorry? Um, look, that's been uh, directly negotiated with State Development. We're overseeing it, but it's being managed by them uh, at site, which I'm very, very pleased about because it means our uh, health workers can get back into our hospitals and continue to support our vaccination and testing clinics. Uh, you'd have to talk to the Deputy Premier about that process. He uh, it was run by State Development. No, they took the construction risk. They built it. Uh, we put funding towards it. Uh, again, I'm not going to comment on a process that was run under, under another department. So you, the Deputy Premier can explain the process. But uh, These are the costs I've got. These are the costs that... Um, these are the figures that we have uh, agreed to release and the Wagner's agreed to release in commercial and confidence. Your department has a contract um, Look, I'm not going to say never. It all depends on the quantum. There's a whole range of procurement processes that we all comply across every government agency. Uh, and it, you know, there's a whole range of criteria that has to be met in relation to that. So it all depends on the circumstances. Uh, the quantum whole range of factors. So, you know, before there's accusations that procurement criteria haven't been met, uh, you know, certainly put those questions and get that information before we go down that rabbit hole. Can I ask you? No. Clearly, um, I, I wasn't there. I'm not going to speak for the premier. Her statement's very clear. She obviously. Um, was willing to consider releasing the figures if the Commonwealth did, and that's what's happened. And I, I welcome that we've put these figures out. Can I, can I ask no. Jonathan, you well, he's wrong, uh, and I saw him this morning on a morning program uh, talking about how he's got concerns about Jeddah Gardens uh, and uh, their compliance. Uh, my understanding is the regulatory, the Commonwealth regulatory body uh, was looking at non-compliance back in August uh, with this body. So I'm a little bit surprised it's had to come out of a Senate committee uh, questioning, as I understand it, around Jetta Gardens for suddenly them to be concerned about this facility. And they shouldn't be just talking about one facility, they should be looking at all of the aged care facilities across Australia and making sure that there's compliance and they should be stepping up and administering the Productivity Commission's recommendation, particularly around nurse to resident ratios. So how Look, I, I will say this, there are some fantastic aged care facilities and I don't want every aged care facility in this state being tainted by what we are seeing. But what we do know is that um, they are not adequately paid. We do know that they don't have proper ratios in place. Uh, we do know that COVID has created a significant problem um, in aged care. And this is a conversation that we've been having with the Commonwealth about how they were going to get vaccinated. The fact that the Commonwealth completely dropped the ball as far as vaccinating staff. To think they sent in vaccination teams back in February, March last year to vaccinate residents, knowing that they'd also signed up to doing staff and just didn't do it. And then you know, months later says, oh, well, can, can the states help us out? 
So we did. We stepped in, we prioritised, we allowed every aged care staffer to come in, get prioritised, get uh, vaccinated quickly at our clinics. But that's not good enough. They have dropped the ball all the way through and COVID has just shone a light on that. It has not caused the problem. It's shone a light on the fact that the Productivity Commission's recommendations should be implemented and the Commonwealth needs to be taking responsibility for it. Uh, I haven't got the figures written down in front of me. I believe there's only a very small number. I'm happy to check. I think there's only like six facilities in Queensland that they're um, at at the moment. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's very small numbers. So I am still concerned about whether residents are being locked in their rooms, whether they're being uh, adequately uh, cared for and checked on, uh, that they are having healthy, good quality meals prepared for them. They're getting their meals on time, their medication on time. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I think it's horrifying that, you know, there could be one nurse to 120, 130 residents in aged care facilities. But I think if you talk to workers in the aged care sector, and you'll find it hard to do that because they're pretty scared to speak up because most of them are casual, uh, that, um, you know, that was occurring before COVID. So John, can I just ask you, sorry. Which facilities? I can check whether we've got the specific um, places. Thanks. Sorry, very briefly, John. Ahead, ahead of an expected winter spike and a mid years of staff supplies will be shortage, National Cabinet will consider listing the seven day uh, isolation for close contact, such as negative or asymptomatic. Is that true? Is that a good move? Uh, well, we, the AHPPC, of which I'm a member, will be giving advice. So. so uh, we will be meeting and giving advice on, on that matter, if, if, if that is requested by the uh, National Cabinet. So, sounds uh, we, We'll wait to have that discussion with the AHPPC.